Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be preparing an organic compound called glyoxine. Glyoxine is a fairly interesting molecule in that it is basically ethane dialdehyde dioxine. Enough talking about that. So what I've got here is an ice bath, quite obviously, with a beaker in it which has 75 milliliters of distilled water in it, in which I have dissolved 38.71 grams, or 0.69 moles, of potassium hydroxide. This is currently cooling down to 0 degrees Celsius, which we will need for the reaction, as it is slightly exothermic. Uh, the reaction in general should be kept below 10 degrees Celsius, if at all possible. The next thing I'm going to need is hydroxylene hydrochloride. I can't really use hydroxylamine sulfate because the potassium sulfate produced in the reaction will co-precipitate with the glyoxine. And the final thing I'm going to need is glyoxyl, or ethane dialdehyde. Now, it only ever comes as a 40% solution in water, and of course that's what I have. So, let me first weigh out the 69.5 grams of hydroxylamine hydrochloride. Perfect. 69.5 grams, which I am now going to add to the very cold concentrated sodium hydroxide solution. This will produce free hydroxylamine in solution, as well as sodium chloride, which should also dissolve. So now I'm going to measure out 72.5 grams of 40% glyoxyl solution in water. I'm then going to cool this down a little bit in the fridge and then add it to the mixture which is currently cooling in the ice bath. Now that that's all weighed out, I'm going to measure out 48 milliliters of distilled water and I'm going to dissolve the glyoxyl solution in the extra 48 milliliters of water. Then I'm going to cool it. Okay, it's been a little while, probably about 15 or 20 minutes, and the glyoxyl is nice and cool. Probably around 15 degrees Celsius. And the reaction mixture is at 4.1 degrees Celsius, so well below the maximum temperature for this reaction. So, I'm going to slowly pipette in the glyoxyl solution and measure the temperature and continuously monitor it to make sure it doesn't get above 10 degrees Celsius. Now you may be able to see there is some sodium chloride that hasn't dissolved, and honestly, I really don't care. That's okay. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and start the addition of the glyoxyl solution. So that's all the glyoxyl added, and you can see that some of the glyoxine has precipitated out. And that's good news, that just means that there's more to come. So I'm going to let this stir for a further, probably about 30 minutes or so. Then I'm going to put it in the refrigerator for a further 15 minutes to cool it down, and then I'm going to let it sit out for about an hour and let the crystallization complete. So I'm walking through the lab and this, this is just like 15 minutes later. I really don't think I need to cool this down anymore. I think I can just go ahead and filter it. My goodness. That's amazing. That's just a ton of crystals in there. All right, I'm going to get right to filtering that. So at this point I go on a long tangent about how you have to 
recrystallize the crude glyoxine from diethyl ether, and that's a load of shit, I'm gonna be honest. You don't even need diethyl ether in the first place. So, not only is glyoxine only sort of soluble in diethyl ether, it's... don't even... don't even worry about using diethyl ether. Just completely skip that entire... that entire step. Instead, what I did was I recrystallized it from boiling water, much like you would uh, something like nitroguanidine. That leaves you with much nicer, larger crystals than uh, what you get with the diethyl ether, and you also don't waste about two-thirds of your stock. So I highly recommend not recrystallizing your glyoxine from diethyl ether, and instead doing it from boiling water. With that being said, let's just get on with some things that are more interesting, like, I don't know, salts of glyoxine. Let's try that. Stuff like lead, silver, and copper glyoxamate. That's pretty cool. Let's take a look. So let's start out with something basic. That would be basic copper glyoxamate. It's a brownish black powder and is only mildly sensitive to heat and flame. So let me go ahead and put a butane flame on it and we'll see what it'll do. So you can see nothing astounding, but definitely worth noting. Let's try next. Silver glyoxamate. It's a sort of grayish slash just barely maroon powder, which is fairly sensitive to heat and flame. Let's observe. As we can see, pretty much nothing's left. Interesting. Let's move on to the last of the salts. Finally, we have lead glyoxamate, the most sensitive to heat and flame out of all the glyoxamate salts. Let's observe. Very interesting. And finally, let's take a look at glyoxin itself, which you may be surprised at well, how it reacts to a flame. Let's take a look. Here I have a watch glass on which I'm going to place a small amount of glyoxin. Now I'm going to light it on fire. As you can see, it's pretty tame, I guess you could call it. The closest thing I could compare it to while burning is probably hexamine, although hexamine definitely lasts longer. This property of the parent compound reacting to heat in a way that is, in a way, calmer than its salts is not unusual for compounds like this. Something like ethylene dinitramine burns a lot cooler and calmer than some of its derivatives like EBCN or ethylene bischloronitramine or something like lead or silver or sodium glyoxamate, which you can see here. That was, you know, a few properties, as well as the synthesis of glyoxine. I really hope you enjoyed. This was a very, very fun video to make. You can like if you want to, subscribe if you want to. I thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all next time. Special thank you goes out to my Patreon supporters. I can't make videos like these without all their support. So... I must say thank you. I couldn't do it without you.